All right, so um, I'm going to ask what probably going to sound like a hostile question, but um, I will preface it with this all about you. Strike me as like the most trustworthy people in Boulder. However, um, what do you say to someone that, that says, you know, I, I'm just not comfortable with blogs influencing me, especially in ways that um, are not as overt as a banner advertisement? Yep. That's a, what we not struggle with, but that's actually where we think we have the biggest opportunity because we don't do those straight, blatant, I'm going to buy your opinion or I'm going to buy your, your sponsorship. When brands come to us with that, then we have to educate them on why that's not the right thing to do right here. And so what we're focused on is sponsoring content, integrating a brand where it makes sense, but it has to be content that the reader would have consumed whether we're sponsored or not, or the blogger would have posted whether we're sponsored or not. So the recipes for Creative Crescent. So we're doing a campaign now for King's Hawaiian, and it's, it's Super Bowl tips and, and getting ready for the big game. And for Allstate, it's sharing, sharing hero stories. So we take it a level up where you're not integrating that, that product blatantly. It's just a new type of sponsorship opportunity that actually gets noticed instead of buried, but you're not you're not buying the blogger's uh, opinion, essentially. And, and people are exposed to that all the time and don't even realize it. We're just bringing it to content. So for instance, if you, have, if you watch the Tour de France you, and you see these teams that are sponsored by T-Mobile and Chipotle and Garmin, those brands aren't telling those racers how to race, how to train, what to eat, when to, you know, what to do. They are merely enabling you, know, you enabling that team with equipment maybe facilities, and then they're enabling you to actually watch that content. And if that happens to make you, you know, increase your affinity for that brand, you know, then so be it. But they're, they're not dictating the content, they're just helping to bring it to you. And that's what we're doing. So in our, what, 18 months of doing this, we've done about 100 programs for different brands, all Fortune 500. We have never had a reader complain to saying, you know, this blogger is selling out, or this is, Un unauthentic. So, and again, for those, you know, that's a that's a challenge and an opportunity. We see a, a chance to differentiate ourselves and say, you know, we're not a paid per post or product review company. We're an authentic editorial integrated company at scale. And, and we really go to great lengths to match influencers with brands. We're looking at their demographics and how many kids they have, and maybe they're gluten free. We power Udi's gluten free community, and those are all gluten free bloggers. So. They're excited. It's content that they pro they would have written about anyway, and they get to work with brands that are aligned with their own values. You mentioned something earlier that you guys made a conscious decision that this was not going to be a lifestyle company. You were going to take on outside funding. You did two seed rounds, and you recently did a Series A with GrowTech. Um, and by the way, for those of you who don't know GrowTech, um, Joe Zell is a, uh, a managing director who does all his investing in Colorado. And, but you guys did it through um, Lawson Debris. Lawson as well. So this is a VC out of the Virginia area with a strong Colorado presence. Um, talk a little bit about the bootstrapping experience and maybe the most resourceful thing that you did. And then I'd like to hear about the rationale for deciding that you're going to take on outside funding. Yeah, so I think the first is the office. We work out at Boulder Public Library and uh, leech out their Wi-Fi. Uh, just staying very, very lean. Every dollar counts. We enlist family members to print things and to research bloggers and to uh, help us prepare for conferences. And everything that you can think of where just, just money is so tight and you have to prove that idea before you have the money come in. We, our, all of our furniture came from Salvation Army. And we still have chairs in our office that we keep because they have personalities and they're, they're kind of legacy. We have this one chair we call the humiliation chair. <laughs> and it's kind of this, you know, ratted upholstery chair. And, and for some reason we, we put our, accidentally we'll put our interviewees in this chair because what happens is you'll be at the conference table and all of a sudden it just drops. <laughs> so like the table's right here. And so that's why we call it. And it does it just randomly, so that was why we call it the humiliation chair. <laughs> and, uh, we have a, our very first conference table was uh, one we made that we from a door that we bought at Home Depot that we put legs on and I put the legs on wrong so Rustin had to come in the next day and put them on and we've kept those and so it, it it doesn't have to cost a lot of money and we look back on that now like people have carved their names and all kinds of things in this door and um, yeah it's just 
you, you can make it happen. You know, if you, you know, you, if you want to do it bad enough, you know, you'll find a way. Say before to put some hardcore numbers out there. Before we raised our first amount of funding, we probably put five thousand dollars into the company, and and maybe even a little less than that. So, for example, our logo, which this is actually a stripped down version, our latest because it was too good or too exciting, we got for ninety dollars on Elance uh, through some guy in India made made the logo, right? And all these these things that you can do to start a company without without spending a lot. Now, ideally, if you can code it all, or if you can sell someone, enroll someone on your idea to help you code that idea if you're in the software space, that's what really decreases the, pro the cost. And then your question about deciding to scale it up. So that was, that was never really a question. I think that came out pretty early, that we wanted to build something, something big, something, something meaningful that we could share, that we could make an impact in the, the community, that we could employ a lot of people, that we could bring a lot of revenue uh, into into Boulder, Colorado, and uh, so that was that was really it was just a question of how do we get there? Do we raise five million dollars to start, or do we raise this angel money and, uh, and and get us off the ground? And of course, the right answer is you raise that angel money and, and build up to it. But in fact, you think you're Zuckerberg, you don't know that. And uh, so it was never never really a question, but it does put your your startup on that different trajectory. And there's nothing wrong with with doing those those lifestyle type businesses, and in fact, depending on what your idea is and how big of an impact it can have, and I would actually recommend it and say, hey, you know, not all businesses are, are venture back businesses or are venture backable, and uh, if it's if it doesn't make sense, then build that into that lifestyle business, get that cash flow coming, and put that cash into what's going to be your next business. Like if you hear the story of Dropbox, he had an idea, it was bringing in a little bit of money and and he was about to go out to raise uh, a bunch of money or, or a little bit of money. He said, you know what, let me just take that and build this Dropbox idea I've had. He went, built this uh, minimum viable product, and now it's a multi-billion dollar company. And we, we knew that we wanted to raise funding, but we didn't want to have to raise funding. Because when you have to raise it, it's a whole different ballgame and you, and you don't have any leverage. So we worked really hard the six to nine months before we even um, went out to, you know, to begin venture capital relationships and, and you know, shifted our revenue model and found ways to drive revenue from our bloggers. We, we added premium services, so our, our products were free, our tools were free for bloggers. So we added a premium layer that was like $5 a month and then another layer that was about $20 a month because we knew the first thing we were going to have to do is prove that we could drive revenue. And that was, our own, that was the only base we could drive revenue from. Since then, now three and a half years later, we've shut those premium services down and gone back to offering them all for free. Because we, what we did that in the early days because we wanted to drive revenue and we wanted to get the company to a point, which we did in December of, of 2011, where, where we wanted, you know, we could go out and solicit for funding and if we didn't want to take it and there, they weren't good terms, we were willing to just grow it organically. Um, if you go back, and have a conversation with yourself in 2009-ish when you're about ready to go out and raise your first seed round. Um, what's something that you would say, don't do it that way? And what was something that you're about to do this? Absolutely, that's going to work. Keep going in terms of fundraising process. Does everybody remember 2009, the heart of the recession, right? <laughs> Laying off people. And uh, the week before I quit, they laid off 200 people from Ball Aerospace. And I told my boss, he said, Kidding, we just laid those people off. And he said, I know, I was hoping I was one of them. <laughs> I wanted that severance package. Instead, he's going to make me quit. So, um, but, but going back to that, but prior to that time, you just needed a good idea, right? If you had a good idea, yeah, I'll fund that, and that can be the next big thing. Then you needed a good idea and traction. People got pretty smart and said, well, now you've got to show me that there's traction out in the marketplace, like Facebook. You know, they had millions of people using it. And that's going to be the big thing. But in 2009, you actually needed a good idea. You needed to show traction, lots of people using it. And you had to show revenue, how you were going to make money, even if it's smallest forms. You had to have dollars coming in. So that's why we, we built 